Thank you, everyone. Take your seats. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, welcome everyone to the Improving Population Health uh, theme meeting for the ARC Northwest Coast. So, what we're going to be talking about today is one of our uh, um, projects that's sort of supported through the ARC but funded by the Health Foundation, uh, which is called Economies for Healthier Lives. So it's working in particular with the, um, well, led by the Combined Authority, so Liverpool City Region Combined Authority, uh, and it's it's looking at how we can better support and how we can better join up uh, health and employment services. Uh, and you know, as we were talking this morning with our other uh, program, one of the big things that has happened to the pand pandemic has been people being moved out of employment and uh, increases in how people's health is affecting their employment. Uh, so this program is about how we can better uh, support the health services and some of the employment services that the, the city region uh, provide and other uh, organizations provide across the across the city region uh, to better support people uh, within uh, in employment. And Phil's going to be uh, taking us through that uh, with some of our uh, guests. Uh, I'll leave you to do any introductions that you want to do, Phil. Yeah, cool. Is that working? I think so. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Hi, uh, my name's Phil McCall. I'm a senior clinical lecturer in the Department of Public Health Policy and Systems at the University of Liverpool. <laughs> And as Ben mentioned, so today's session is going to be around the Economies for Healthier Lives project. So quick background to the project. It's funded by the Health Foundation, and it's basically a collaboration between ourselves at the University of Liverpool, Liverpool John Moores University, and the Liverpool City Region Command Authority. So I'm going to go over a bit of background, but to start with, I'm just going to do some basic definitions so people know what we're talking about. So if uh, a person is employed, that means they're in paid work. If they're unemployed, that means they're out of work, but they're actively seeking work. And if they're economically inactive, that means they're out of work and they're not actively seeking work. So, um, so we know employment affects health and there is an awful lot of long-standing evidence that unemployment negatively affects both physical health and mental health. And this evidence goes back decades and includes um, basically all parts of the world. So why is this important though? So if we look, um, I'm trying to do this from memory because I can't remember. Um, the Northwest is fourth in the country for the highest rates of unemployment. So we know unemployment negatively affects health and we know unemployment is a significant problem in the Northwest. But it's not just unemployment that matters. Things like working conditions and working hours particularly can affect um, mental health and stress through the work-life balance. And um, you can have issues with safety at work, which can lead to uh, workplace-related injuries. And I mentioned there about job control, because job control is actually a really important part of keeping people in work particularly when they have long-term health conditions. So we know employment affects health, but actually health also affects employment. And this is really important because actually over the next few decades, we're predicting that the number of long-term conditions amongst people with of working age is going to increase. And that's not just individual conditions. We're also going to see a big increase in multimorbidity. So people are going to have more complex needs that require support. 
And people with long-term conditions are more likely to be economically inactive. They're more likely to retire from the workforce earlier. So people with multiple sclerosis are have an average retirement age of 42, which is obviously much lower than the national retirement age. Um, they're more likely to have sickness absence, but importantly, they're actually also more likely to attend work when they're sick, so-called presenteeism, which basically means they're risking further consequence. So the example I saw was about someone with asthma who has a chest infection attends work and actually makes their chest worse and ends up requiring more time off work because of sickness. Oh, what have we done? There we go. So health and employment have a cyclical relationship. It can be a virtuous cycle. Good health improves employment prospects, which in turn improves health but it can also be a vicious cycle. So poor health leads to reduced employment chances, which then leads to worse health and et cetera, et cetera. So as a response to this, the Northern Health Science Alliance in 2018 did a piece of work looking at health and work in the UK and particularly focusing on the Northern Powerhouse, which I don't think is really still a thing. I think it's more the level up agenda now, if that's still good. Um, so what they found there was productivity is lower in the North of England than the South. Um, there is a big link between long-term health conditions and economic activity, which we already know from the evidence base. Um, importantly though, increasing NHS budgets would lead to reduction in um, economic activity through support for people. Um, importantly, the short periods of sickness actually have worse employment consequences for people in the North than in the South. So not only are you more likely to have sickness leave if you're in the north and the south, but actually once you get have a short period of sickness, the consequences for your long-term employment prospects are worse than in the south of England. Um, and essentially the take-home point from the report was if we improve health in the north, that would substantially improve the economy in the north as well. So I'm going to focus now on Liverpool City Region, which is where the EHL project is based. So Liverpool City Region's selection of six local authorities, Liverpool, Sefton, St. Helens, Wirral, Holton and Nosley. Basically, Liverpool City Region has one of the highest proportions in the country of people who are economically inactive, almost one in four. It has one of the lowest proportions of people who are employed, which is less than three quarters. Um, our edu educational attainment levels lag like behind both the regional and national averages would suggest that there is a skills gap in the region as well. Um, we have 78% of employees in the private sector, which is lower than the national average. And our productivity is around 92% of the national rate. We also have worse health in the city region. So the full city region is quite a deprived area. Um, and our measure of deprivation is based on seven domains. 
Actually, when we look at the measures of the, the domains of deprivation, we see that in Liverpool City region, a lot of the deprivation has really been driven by health and disability deprivation. Um, and we also see that when we compare ourselves nationally. So in England, we're the third highest area for people who are economically inactive report long-term sickness as the reason for that. Nearly a third of our economically inactive population. Um, and one in four working age people in LCR have limiting health conditions. And we have a life expectancy in the region of two and a half years lower than the national average. So a third of the productivity gap is estimated to be due to ill health. Actually, if we worked on reducing this ill health, this health gap with the rest of England, it could lead to approximately 3.2 billion pounds extra for our economy. So this is where the economy is for healthier lives project steps in. So it's a 1.72 million program from um, from uh, the Health Foundation. Um, and basically it's looking at how we can promote health and reduce health inequalities through economic development. It's for four programs across the UK and it's for three years in total. And it's a program that's been led by the statutory regional body with partnership with academic organisations. So we have four regions. There's the LTR, one which we're talking about today. There's also programmes in Leeds, Lay Park and Glasgow City region. So... Our local program is focused on creating labor market programs with public health at their core of their aim. Um, and we're gonna start doing this with three strands. We're doing evidence reviews, stakeholder engagement, and data analysis and efficacy audit. Basically what that will do is we will use the data from all three of those strands to help us and inform our redesign of employment services. The idea of um, having an enhanced approach to employment support. So, so just quickly to go over those three strands, we have the rapid evidence reviews, which is going to be reviews of employment support programs already in place in the city region with a particular focus on helping people with health conditions or disabilities. Basically, what we want to do is we want to understand what is going on in the region, what support we have available already. And then we want to situate that in the wider evidence base so that we can see how we look versus international evidence to see what gaps there might be in our offer. And we have particularly identified a typology for the different types of support we'll provide. So this typology basically splits support into three different groups. You either support the, um, the employer to make sure the workplace and the work environment is as suitable as possible for people with different needs. You either focus, you can also focus on the individual to strengthen their ability to actually access employment. 
And then um, the final one is you can actually do both. You can work to do both at once. Second part is going to be the stakeholder engagement. So we want to find out what the people and the stakeholders in our communities actually think about what services are currently available. And that will include people who work for employment support programs, people who work in health, uh, residents and clients. And actually we had our first stakeholder engagement event this morning. And then finally, we're going to do an analysis of the Household Into Work program, which is going to be looking at approximately 1,500 users. And we're going to look at the dem demographic breakdown, but also the health conditions that we support in the program. And compare it to what we know about Liverpool City region to say, of their demographic groups who maybe aren't accessing the support we think should be. And particularly as well of the health conditions that we would expect to be getting support given what we know about the region, but they aren't. And then basically what we'll do is we'll take the findings from those three strands and we'll find out what our unmet need is in the city region. So we'll look at what groups aren't accessing support, but also what types of support don't we provide for the region. And then finally, in the longer term, we will look to link up the data from health and employment to give us better understanding of the link between the two. Thanks, Phil. Um, sorry, I'm just a bit nervous because Phil did such a good job there, so I'm proud to wrap something now. Um, my name is Belinda Tyrrell, and I work at the University of Liverpool as a research associate. And the reason why I was asked to speak today is I'm involved in the WADER uh, project because we're the leader on the evidence reviews, but I've also had was lucky enough to do um, an 18 month evaluation of the Liverpool City Region's Household Into Work programme. And luckily enough, Phil set me up with some of these slides, so I might not have to talk all about the contact stuff. So you might be spared a few minutes of me. Um, oh gosh, I've broke, see, broken that already. So <laughs> that's just to reiterate the coverage of the programme. So it spans the Liverpool City Region, it goes across each of the local authority areas. And as Phil mentioned, really, the Liverpool City region is an area with a lot of great potential, but we've lagged behind nationally, mostly due to poor health outcomes. So although there's been investment in different types of provision over the years, back in 2017, the DWP launched a budget to support innovation in terms of how employment was delivered. And the Liverpool City Region Combined Authority thought, well, the data is telling us maybe it's time to do something different and try and address some of those multiple and long-standing barriers people have had to enter and sustain and work. So they took the learning from three different programmes. So working well in Manchester Greater Authority, so that was the key worker approach there. The Troubled Families programme, which is more of a household approach, so involving more than the individual in the programme. And they, I always get this one wrong, so bear with me, the Youth Employment Gateway. So that was a, a, where there was a small budgetary allocation to support households. So what was innovative about it was the household approach in that it brought in more than just the individual who was seeking work or experiencing difficulties sustaining work. It brought in other family members, neighbours or friends to really bring people together to support them through the journey of change on the programme. So each household received 12 months dedicated support from an employment advocate and they worked with the employ the householders worked with the employment advocates actually to develop a plan of activity, how they saw themselves wanting to progress on the programme. So it wasn't as prescriptive as other employability programmes. And I should also say as well as part of our research, we didn't have a control group to compare a certain um, interactions or interventions against. So 
sorry, I've just got a crane in my neck. <laughs> so really looking at the, how the program works with people, I might actually whiz through that slide. Or did it go past? I had a really brilliant slide and I did not include it on the deck, but basically it was to just sort of explain what the program felt like for people while they were on it. So traditionally you might go into an office and be looking for work and have a desk-based employment support. And although people were referred to the program from the job centre, households into work ran slightly differently in that really it was built around the individual and what they wanted to do and what they wanted to achieve. And part of that was actually the employment advocates going out and meeting people where they felt comfortable. And the other big part of it as well was just touching on the presentation we had earlier about the CAB. There was almost a social prescribing element of the programme. So advocates would discuss with households what sort of how they were feeling, what they wanted to achieve on the programme. And they'd then work together to try and find interventions that might support people to make progress in the labour market. So that could be things like joining a book club, joining a gym. One of the things that was truly transformational for me was when I did the interviews two years ago, I, I was talking to a woman and, you know, she'd suffered from back pain for years and years. Joining the programme, she was able to lose weight, get fitter, and she progressed back into part-time work, which for her was a big achievement. But there were two things about that which she really credited. One was having the advocate support, which was sort of, Mr. Non-judgmental sounding board for what they wanted to achieve. And one was actually being able to have someone support you make that breakage into wider service provision. And that was something I think that is really interesting for the economies of health program is how different services, both statutory services and community-based services can work together. So oh gosh, I'm all over the place this afternoon. I'm so sorry, everyone. Normally, it's only John and Phil's professional integrity, like I take down, but I've really taken everyone in the rooms down today. Um, oh, gosh. Clearly, it's a problem with the clicker, not me. <laughs> um, so what was achieved on the programme was 20% of households were, it, were moved into employment. Indicators of resilience as well, longer term. People felt that they built resilience through the approach of households. To put that in perspective, I met a, a woman who'd been out of work for 20 years. She'd had some experiences with addiction and she started the programme and I always remember telling the story of the people who travelled here with me this morning heard the story, so apologies. Um, she, she accessed a community centre with an advocate and she, she was quite a shy person. And the first couple of times the advocate went with her and they introduced her to someone from the centre. And then she went back to do a course, but the course wasn't on. The, they hadn't had enough people to register. But she stayed and had a coffee and she spoke to the people there. And she met the woman who uh, she'd been speaking to, and they connected her with voluntary opportunities there. So she started to work in the kitchen garden. And it, it was such a breakthrough for her because I always remember she said to me, Oh, you know, I didn't do what I would have done before. I didn't shy away. I felt like I was worthy to do this and make this connection. And I spoke to her again during lockdown. She'd been and worked in the catering industry and she was furloughed. But again, her positivity and resilience was, was so amazing because she actually said, things will be back open soon, I'll be back at work, I've done it once before, I can do it again. And I think it showed really that approach really building resilience, so it wasn't just skills alone, skills were part of the programme, but it was actually taking someone and introducing them to a wider network and maybe finding things out about themselves, like what they were good at and what they saw they wanted to do, rather than a prescriptive approach to it. So sorry, I went off piece there, but I hope that <laughs> gave you a good flavour of it. And I, I did think for me anyway, more than the data, it was actually the stories of people being able to get back and do things that they wanted to do for a while, but they didn't know that those services were out there. So that's why I think having people as part of the Economies of Health, Healthy Allows programme is a good opportunity to build on that and understand how services might work better together. Oh gosh. Phil? Mr. Wilson, I 
Yes, that's fine. Thanks, Belinda. That was great. Um, so now we're going to take uh, the rest of the session just to do uh, panel discussions. We had a wide range of people uh, sitting at the table here. And um, we're going to give the audience the opportunity to ask questions if they want. Um, I will start it off and then give people a chance to introduce the chat if they want to. Um, and, so, and then they can just pass around, then the audience can get involved. So I think to start with, um, I think what are like the benefits, barriers, and like what is missing in terms of the support that is available thinking about like households, but also different things. So. Thank you. My name's Georgie um, and I work at the Life Rooms, which is a NHS organisation, um, but we work under a social model of health. So um, we work through like a three pillar approach. And part of that is about including people um, uh, within local communities to get back into employment. So anybody who is um, under a primary or secondary care team um, and wants to get back into employment, we support them to do so. Um, the way that I, it's, it's the IPS service that we host in the life rooms um, and, you know, people are referred in, but we we'll also have a social prescribing service and we do often see that a lot of the things that people are coming to us um, for support around is around things, um, you know, such as isolation, um, mental well-being, finance issues, and I think all of those things are uh, improved, I suppose, when you are at, when you are in work. I mean, if I even think about myself personally, like I know that when I've got to do something in work, I, you know, I need to get up and, and get organised, and it gives me like a bit of a sense of purpose. So um, we do quite a lot of support at work with people in that front, but we also, um, I think, when you say kind of what's missing, um, a big part of what we do is about providing people with learning opportunities to give them the confidence to do that in the first place. Um, so I think if people, if somebody's been out of work for a long time, um, there's you know a range of different things that um, they would need further support on. There's you know massive implications of people out of work, and a lot of the time people just want to come to us to um, improve their confidence and their skills. So we have um, you know vocational coaches, we have people to support with. Um, CV writing, and I think um, I kind of lost my train of thought now. <laughs> I can't really remember what I was saying. Um, yeah, basically, we do all of these things in the life rooms, and I think for me, <clears throat> what I maybe I feel might be missing is that I wonder whether employees, um, whether we do enough engagement with employees to say, you know, this should be the norm, this should be, um, you know, people with either mental health conditions or disabilities, you don't need to make all these, you know, crazy adjustments, it should be kind of part of everybody's normal practice. Um, I wonder whether we do enough engagement with employers um, to make that kind of standard practice and business as usual. Can I ask us just a quick question before you move on? I just wonder whether you could explain what IPS is um, for people, because, yeah, yeah sure. people might not know what that is. So I'm going to um, pretend I remember the acronym. Um, individual. individual Placement Support, that's the one. Um, so it's about people who have accessed um, primary or secondary care and who are under the support of maybe a community mental health team and are wanting to get back into employment. So um, we have employment specialists who will work with um, people who have expressed this um, to improve their um, employability skills and also to support them with applications for different roles and then they follow them through with that journey so once somebody is in employment once they've gone through that process they will work with them um, and do you know regular check-ins to make sure that their employment is going well to ensure that there's been the correct adaptations made um, and then keep linking back in with their clinical teams to ensure that that person is also staying well. Um, have we missed anything there? I can't think. No, no, that sounds good. <laughs> I just thought we'd sort of 
Hi, my name's Ant. Um, I'm an employment advocate with Households Into Work team. I joined the team about 18 months ago. Previously, I worked for social care for 16 years. Um, we used Households Into Work for, for referrals for clients we work with. Um, found the programme was really good. And, and when I had the opportunity, I moved over. Um, as an employment advocate, it, it, it's not the greatest job title that describes what we do. We're more like a life coach. Um, that might be a little bit controversial, but um, we're quite adaptable. And, and on the ground, we build relationships with people and help them work through their barriers. And we go on a journey together for up to 12 months. And um, we find that a lot of clients naturally um, we get outcomes for, whether that's volunteering, whether that's paid employment, um, or just generally um, there's more stability in their lives. Um, we work with, with clients with, with multiple barriers. Um, and yeah, we're just, um, it's pretty much us in a shell. Some questions, I think. Oh. <coughs> one, one, of the, one of the factors that was highlighted in one of the earlier talks today as a barrier for getting back into employment was um, the carer's role. And I wondered if you're working with households, does, does, you know, so you understand, you know, not just one person's perspective, but everything else that's going on around them. Does that make it easier to try and crack that really difficult nut? Yeah, um, I know when I work for social care, um, the program was set up where it had to be um, two people who came onto program. So that could be another family member, or it could be just a friend. Um, I then came onto program and that changed. So we could, we could work with individuals. Jordan and Andrea, they're currently on program with myself. Initially, Jordan was referred by the health centre um, for some support around his mental health, anxiety, quite isolated. Um, following me meeting Jordan, going through registration and then building a bit of a relationship, I was having lots of chats with Andrea and I just felt it was appropriate for her to also come on board and be registered. Andrea is, is Jordan's carer. Um, and having that combination of the two, yeah, we, we, we've made some good progress. And we've done things like um, we, we run a garden group in Halton. So we're just sort of like growing that at the minute. Um, and we do things like um, we, we start a fishing group as well. With Jordan and myself, we go for walks and with Andrea and, you know, general catch ups and just sort of working through through the barriers. Yeah. Just if I can just ask a quick question sort of related to that, I guess one of the things we're interested in is how we can well, better link up different services, you know, whether it's in social care or you know, health or, or housing. And I guess that's you know, whether, whether there's hopefully benefits from that. Um, I was thinking around, around caring, you know, other support that, that might be available for carers and things. You know, how do you work with those, you know, like the, the council's social care kind of support for carers and stuff like that? Does that, does that work well? Are there other ways that it could be done better? Um, I know, Andrew, you're open to the Carers Centre, aren't you? Um, so Andrew was already sort of on board with them. And I find that working with other agencies is about building a bit of a relationship um, and, and, you know, making them regular referrals and, and the face-to-face -face stuff on the ground and, and, yeah, working in partnership to sort of make improvements. Um, in regards to care inside, what do you think? Is there anything that is missing from your perspective? <laughs> I'll start singing if I give me a mic. Um, bear with me, I'm a bit nervous, but um, I forgot what I was going to say then. From the carer's side. Um, from the carer's side, I feel as though there should be more community groups uh, where people from the community get together and just, you know, share experiences and just generally it care center is brilliant don't get me wrong but there needs to be something just a bit more local for people to attend and just, um you mean like the community center and things like that <laughs> yeah yeah it's pretty easy access yeah yeah. 
yeah. on sort of get, getting you guys out. And it was something that you really wanted Jordan to link back into. Yeah, Because that was previously open. Yeah. Um, so that's been a real positive. And I know it's early days. It's a bit of a mess at the minute. But yeah. I suppose that's part of the journey, isn't it? And but it's forward. looking forward to next year when the weather starts to get better. And, you know, we're planning what we're going to do. And, you know, it's all just, what do you think, Jordan? No. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I think where 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 you were at when you first came on program, uh, we we had sort of the the effects of COVID and stuff like that weren't very kind, and um, I think we, we we went on a bit of a journey, didn't we? Literally, we went for walks and stuff like that, and you guys were quite hesitant, weren't you? When Tess at the health centre first mentioned the referral yeah. to our team, it was a little bit like, well, we've done it, we've done it before with everyone, um, and then see me coming out meeting face to face and sort of taking baby steps to get Jordan yeah. in, a, in, a, in a good place to be able to go through registration and get him on program and then I think we've flown since then I yeah think. definitely I mean you deserve a medal no oh god <laughs> but the, the amount of talks we've had <laughs> you, you really do um and the relationship with Jordan as well yeah. I mean it's just grown over the last six six months or so. Yeah, yeah, roughly, yeah. You know, and, you know. I think that sometimes yeah. certain things, what, what people offer on, on the face of it, on the tin, um, I think just getting down to the nitty-gritty and getting to know people, being being a good listener and, and, and building a relationship with people is the key for me. Um, I know, like I say, I worked for social care for 16 years, um, so I had lots of experience working with people. And I think this programme... Is, is good because you can be really flexible. We're, we're, we're like a jack of all trades. Um, and, and, and there's something new every day. That's what I love about the job. It's very fast paced. Um, we work with up to like 30 people at a time. Um, we're linking with partners in, in the community to, you know, get, get, get regular referrals. But it is very fast paced. And, and that's one thing I really like about, about the programme. Yeah, I think it was a couple of really important points there. Yeah, the the... The kind of relationship that you know, someone like yourself can build up with the with the people you're working with uh, is what is 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 probably one of the most important things of the whole kind of uh, intervention, and, and quite often that gets kind of messed up by by the constraints that organisations put or the kind of rules that you have to follow, and, and in some ways having things you know less uh, um, sort of regimented and, and less uh, um, less less rules around that uh, actually helps with that kind of relationship yeah. i think time is the big the big thing having that time to yeah. be able to spend yeah. with people yeah. and, and and work through things yeah and opportunities then for the people you're working with like andrew and jordan to be able to make connections with others uh, seems to be really important we just had a few questions at the back do you want to yeah okay um so i'll, I'll go over there Never, mind, I think you're waiting patiently for us. <laughs> <coughs> uh, it sounds great with the household you, you, you're working with. How do you know which households to work with, is my question. Um, we, we have a uh, pre registration, so we go through whether people are eligible um, and suitable for program obviously unemployed and they have um, multiple barriers. So we, we do get lots of referrals where it might just be a housing need. So yeah. we maybe pass that on just to, to a housing service. Um, we get lots of referrals from places like the job center. We link in with lots of partners in, in, our, in our area. Um, and yet there's, there's, there's a registration process where we, we just gather sort of like information on the client to see whether they're suitable for program. Yeah. And do you think you identify the, the most needy households? Do you think any, any get missed? Um, definitely, yeah. I think there's households that are, that, that, that are quite um, isolated and that they, they would never have the confidence to, to, to take that first step to agree to a referral. Yeah. Um, we, we sit in the job centre uh, maybe half a day a week and um, just ad hoc when, when clients come in. Uh, a way coach might say, oh, oh Ant's over there, you know, do you want to have a chat about what's going on in your life? And, and, and sometimes that can just kick off people just having that general chat and, you know, just them sharing what's going on and then sort of making a bit of a plan then to, to you know, work through registration, get them on board 
And then once you build a bit of a trust, a bit of a relationship, it's about them working through things together. Sometimes it might be about linking into um, more, more specific agencies w w within our area, but we would always support to do that as we go on the journey. But I find that a lot of the time it's working on the ground with people and having a good relationship is the best way to move forward. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I always find it amazing when somebody shows me all the statistics to do with Liverpool. What a shitty place it all is for the people that kind of live in it. It's absolutely a terrible place to be. And it has been like that since 1931 or something. Uh, so um, my question always is, and still remains the same, what can be done strategically about those kind of issues that you've uh, raised? What, what can a group of people like the ARC actually do? Because uh, I, I, I can see research very clearly, but what I don't see is like action, what action can be done uh, at the strategic level uh, and I think that's, for me personally, that's like the important thing that ought to grow out of, of research. You know, so what, yeah. what can action? I mean, I know a lot about housing cooperatives uh, that did very well, you know, in the 1970s and 80s. And they had the action plans to do things to improve parts of the city. And you'll, you'll all know the ones that did, did well. Uh, and I think, you know, they, they had a strategy, they had a plan, and they, they kind of worked forward with health issues, with housing issues, you know, with all those kind of important issues that, that we're talking about. So I, I'm, I'm interested to know, on the basis of the research, what, you know, what was the action plan uh, that, you know, you want to do? I mean, I know the life rooms, because I go there, it's kind of the... <laughs> teach people how to draw and paint, as simple as that, you know, and that's my action plan. Uh, and I think the life rooms are really good, but they're tiny, aren't they? There's only five of them. Uh, I mean, that's a starting point. Uh, and I, I just wonder, is there anything in the, uh, the life rooms that can be kind of carried over, a robe over, you know, to doctor surgeries and kind of things like that? Uh, I was speaking to somebody about the, the Maggie's uh, cancer care buildings uh, and also about buildings in the 1930s in uh, the Finsbury Health Centre and the Peckham Health Centre. You know, people knew what they wanted to do and they, they did the plan and they built the things and I think that's what you know, the group needs to kind of uh, be thinking about what is the plan. What was the action? Yeah, absolutely. Um, did you want to come back on that? I so can't can't answer every part of the question. Funny enough, I was having a conversation with someone the other week, pretty much about the same thing. I grew up in Liverpool in the seventies and eighties. And I'm privileged enough at the moment where I work to be in the new developments in Pierhead. And we were looking out the window and the conversation was, oh, I don't even know. Do you know, you wonder why you bother doing this job. You just see the same old, same old all the time. It just gets you down and down. And does anything ever change? As we were looking out the window, I said, well, it does. It just doesn't change quick enough for us to notice at times. There's always room for improvements. So I was looking at the Albert Dock. I was reminded when Boys in the Black stuff was on, of a couple of the scenes there, when Chrissy and someone was walking around before the redevelopment took place. The Albert Dock was, as it had been left, quite derelict. The actual dock area was filled with silt and all that. And I'm looking down thinking, okay, that's great. It's coming a long, long way. I was looking across the road to where Paradise bus station used to be and such and thinking, wow. And I think part of the problem at times is, 
change is never going to happen as rapidly as we like. It's never going to touch on all of the areas that we would like to do. But I think we do a quite a poor job in celebrating what we do manage to achieve at times. And then we also need to make sure that we don't fall into a period of complacency where we think, haven't we done great? Because we haven't. Because the next generation needs to benefit from it and the next generation, the next generation. My particular role leading on economies for healthy lives, I feel quite privileged that I'm able to go across all six of the local authority areas within the city region. And have conversations with people which are quite open and honest about what we need to do better. But I am constantly surprised by the number of community voluntary sector organisations that exist grassroots level. I don't know how they exist because they don't always live off much funding, but they manage to do some fantastic services. And what I'm trying to do, as we are with Economy for Healthy Lives now, is to be able to raise the profile of those services and organisations and say, these do a great job, but they don't get the they don't get the visibility that they need. Furthermore, some of the things that sometimes go on in one local authority area aren't necessarily replicated in another local authority area because there isn't the facility to have that dialogue and open communication where you can share ideas. That's what we're looking to do there. But it does go back to the point where we need to be challenged and questioned constantly. It's no coming back in here and saying, we've done a great job, look at what we've done. It's we've done a great job, look at what we've done at the moment, but we've got more to do. And as the members of the HL team have said there, we need to be very much led by the, the residents themselves. And that's where our focus is. We want to know from residents what the elephants in the room is, and we want to hear warts and all. And quite often, it may be a case of saying, there's nothing we can do about that at this moment in time, but please be aware of that we are aware of it. However, what we are hoping to do is do these other things, and that I hope in itself will be enough sometimes just to assure people that there is progress. Um, but yeah, there's certainly nothing wrong with being kicked up the backside and saying, hey, don't be sitting on your laurels, there is more to be done. Thanks, John. Yeah, and I, and I think, yeah, there are some brilliant examples of services and, and the kind of support we've been hearing about uh, and we're hearing about earlier today. You know, some of it linked to GP practices and, and you know, a lot of, there is some really good uh, work going on and, and a lot of this is about trying to sort of expand that. Um, but we also, you know, the, the it's the economy, the, the economy kind of underlying a lot of the, the, the kind of problems that, that we're talking about. And, you know, we also need to look at, uh, you know, there has been some great economic developments in, in Liverpool and other places. One could question, you know, whether people have necessarily benefited from them as, as much as they could have done. Uh, and uh, part of this program is trying to think, you know, working with the combined authority, which does have quite a lot of responsibility for stewardship of the overall economy of the region, how we can sort of help um, yeah, ensure that those the sort of economic programs and economic development uh, does kind of boost the parts of the economy that benefit people the most. Um, other work we've been doing with Preston uh, City Council uh, has been looking at their kind of economic model where they've really tried to focus specifically on building the parts of the economy. So some of the social enterprises, for example, uh, that are likely to have those benefits. And that seems to have had a quite a good impact. Um, so, uh, Linda and then. <laughs> could, I, sorry, could I just ask and a quick question? Because um, if I don't, I'll feel really bad about this the rest of the evening. Um, you spoke really about the importance of the relationships that you've built up. And I, I knew that when I was going out with people, how important that was really just to, I suppose, support people through those processes and navigate all of those different processes. And although we can say there's lots of provision out there, it's not always easy to access or know about. And I think from the EHL perspective, one of the things we're interested in really is how do you get services to work together? So it's less about the service outcomes, and more about the outcomes for individuals. Like how is in your role on the ground, how do you get sort of other partners and other services involved? How do you find out about them? How do you keep those relationships going? Because I can imagine that's quite difficult to do. Yeah, I suppose it's um, every day you learn something new, you're linking with someone new. And I, I always find that just building a, a relationship, you know, on, just a bit of a personal level and 
having that sort of face-to-face. -face. I always find I had lots of links from my social care days. So when I came onto the team, I was able to link the team into a lot of, a lot of the services that I knew about. But whenever there's someone new, I always find that going in and doing a face-to-face -face or tagging onto a team meeting um, and doing it that way and just, just really keeping things going and, and, and thanking people for, you know, when they take a referral and keeping people updated and, and, and yeah, just, just really keeping things going on the ground level and, yeah. Uh, just one, sorry, just to add on top of what Anthony says, because he is taking, he is taking himself for granted. I think one of the things the employment advocates tend to have to do as well as make sure that they are constantly visible. They don't sit in an office off somewhere. They are out in the communities. They meet with individuals where it's convenient for the individual, not for them. Coffee shops, libraries, parks. But also, as they're tested on their own reputations. So if Anthony does a lousy service, that soon get out and people won't bother using them and referring to him. So it's also testament to the fact that the, the nature of Anthony's relationship with the other organisations, I would hope, reflects the fact that he is taken seriously incredible by them. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ben. Thanks, everybody. And thanks for two great talks. Really interesting. And thanks to the panel for being so grounded. Um, I guess my comment really is about the, the equity, um, the, the look at the, the uh, help. Do you call it healthy? Econ no, economies for health. Economies for healthy lives. So um, one, when I was doing uh, a fair bit of work around well-being and community well-being, uh, I was working very closely with somebody in, um, in, uh, in Norwich who was looking at well-being at work, so workplace well-being, and pretty much all of his systematic reviews showed that work is good for people's well-being, right? But it also showed that poor quality work is not good for people's well-being. And I wondered the extent to which that was being taken into account in the work that you're doing. So we know that there's lots of precarious work in the Liverpool city region. We know there's zero hour contracts that are unlikely to go away. So I wondered how much of that sort of input will be, will be, will be taken forward. Uh, yeah, so very fortunate in the position that I'm in, but working for the combined authority, we have a colleague of mine who's recently been developing what's called the Fair Employment Charter. It's for employers <coughs> based within Liverpool City region, encouraging them to sign up to achieve accreditation, but they can only sign up and achieve accreditation if they can demonstrate that they are supporters of fair employment practices. They must pay the national living wage, the national minimum wage. Um, they must be committed to the development of the workforce. They must have processes in place which demonstrate that they can support individuals in the workplace when they are presenting as having health conditions and a whole host of other measures. Now, does that mean that when you sign up, you are the best employer in the world? No. What it means, though, is that we can now start to have a serious and mature conversation with that employer because they've taken the first step. And what we're then looking to do with Economies for Healthy Lives is work with them to see what support we can provide them. And one of the things might be that if they have a workforce that has high levels of absenteeism mm -hmm. due to mental health, is can we then deliver for them, or in conjunction with other partners, mental health first aid training or such. One of the things that's popped up quite recently is the menopause. And there are a lot of organisations now looking to develop policies in the workplace that can help handle menopause and deal with it. Now, I must admit, prior to coming into this role, didn't even cross my mind. My wife goes through the menopause, but I didn't even think about it. But since working on this programme and speaking to other employers, there are those type of enlightenments now which are showing that there are steps being taken place. And our job now is to say, well, how can we facilitate that? And if you're doing it and you're doing it well, how can we make sure that it's replicated elsewhere? So there are small steps, but there certainly is the ambition to make sure that we don't stop what we're doing. Because if employers can't practice... If employees don't come along with us for this particular journey, we're wasting our time here. Because when we want to get people into the workplace, we want to make sure that the employer treats them fairly and that the individual enjoys work as much as they can. So um, when we did house sales, what that was, one of the things actually that came through strongly was it was about good quality work. 
and you know good quality employment for people and I think through this project and with the things I've been involved in it, it is thinking of service reform because I was <coughs> going up to meet people who had you know taken a job that was advertised in a job center and it was zero hours or it was seasonal work and then when the seasonal work ended they were back in the job center system and there was a way then to claim benefits so it's thinking about in this project how all those different parts of the system could connect Great, thanks. Um, well, I have one other question, I guess, for, for, for both of you, uh, Georgie and um, Ant. Um, I was thinking because the house goes into work does use the life rooms or, or has some kind of connection to the life rooms. I wondered how the two things work together and whether or whether there is a, <laughs> if they do work together or not. Um, but, right, right, yeah. Uh, we do have an IPS service across, I think it's Halton, Warrington, uh, the Wirral <clears throat> and Liverpool. Um, so yeah, I think there is some cross, cross collaboration, but um, I think what you were just saying there about the meaningful work is really interesting because like what's meaningful for me might not be meaningful for somebody else at all. And I think that's a really important point. And I, I would argue that maybe, you know, maybe particularly the IPS service, I don't know if, if that really is taken into account that much. Is it more about getting people into work and kind of having a job start and not that it's, you know, depersonalized or anything like that. And I'm not suggesting that that's the case, but I think, um, you know, is the focus on getting people into work or is it getting people into work that is meaningful for them and, and something that adds value to, to their lives? So I think that's a really interesting question and something that we need to kind of ask ourselves in more detail, I think. Well, thank you for a really great conversation. Um, we've unfortunately run out of time now, so I'm going to say thank you to everyone for paying so much attention and some really good questions. But I particularly want to say thank you to our panel who all came here today, and we really appreciate your insights. were brilliant. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the day.